Lanier from the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Douglasville, Georgia. I'll let these guys introduce themselves. Hi, I'm John Locke. I'm from St. James Lutheran Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Brent Nichols, St. Paul Lutheran Church of Pomeria, South Carolina. Pastor Michael Collins at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Lincoln, North Carolina. And today we're going to talk about Judas. This is unscripted, and Brent Nichols is going to be our leader for this discussion. Brent, take it over. Okay, well, um, I think for me, Judas Iscariot is, uh, in, in some ways, the most intriguing character in the whole drama, but more than, I guess, intriguing is not that, the best word. It's uh, the whole, this whole role. And the passion of our Lord is, is, is perplexing. Um, he, um, Judas is the one, of course, who, who betrayed Jesus. Uh, we're told that um, he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, another place, I think, is the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, Judas complains because he thinks some of the money is being wasted and could have been given to the poor, but John says that what he said is not because he cared about the poor, but he would occasionally give them to the money bag himself. Uh, we are told that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, leading him to betray Jesus. And then we're told over in the second chapter of Acts that this whole thing with Judas Iscariot was according to the plan and foreknowledge of God. And so that just ties me in knots theologically when you think about thinking that Judas is a thief, that Satan entered into Judas, and yet, and yet we're told in the book of Acts that it was according to the plan and foreknowledge of God. And, uh, I don't know what to do with that, uh, not only in terms of Judas, but just in terms of God's sovereignty, uh, all of that. But the things, well, that's probably going to get, that's just get too, too broad to even think about that, but um, I don't know. Uh, those, those are the questions that really have concerned me for a long, long, long time. So, I, uh, I don't know what you guys think. Well, Brent, people will say to me quite often, you know, well, it's according to God's plan. And, right. and I always wonder what does that mean? Does it mean that God planned this all out or his will was fulfilled somehow? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's you know, that's part of my problem. Yeah. I mean, if you go back, if you go all the way back to the story of uh, Joseph of Egypt, you know, if you really want to take it back there, you know, you meant it for evil, but God did Good. Uh, raises real theological issues. Well, I think one of the things that uh, comes to mind is that God can use people for God's ultimate will that doesn't seem to make sense at the time, and it's certainly not the way we would do it. Um, but then this whole history of salvation is not the way that most of us would have chosen to do it, but that somehow in the midst of this, God uses uh, what was intended for evil to bring about good, um, and the whole paradox of good Friday, good for us, not so good for Jesus. Um, but there is that sense that God was able to bring about something that was salvific out of the betrayal of our Lord Jesus. Yeah, and that's the only way I can really understand it, Mike. Uh, I, I guess where I get kind of tied up in knots again is, you know, that's really not, that doesn't seem to be what the texts are saying to us. Uh, but, uh, Brent, maybe there's a, well, I, I, I always like to sort of imagine a historical piece of it. So, so what might have been in the officer's mind here, these guys are thinking, yeah, there's got to be somebody to blame. 
uh, like in today's world, if nothing happens without immediately, somebody has to point blame at somebody, and the sooner the better, even before we fix the problem. And it might be that, you know, we had a good thing going, guys, and we had this uh, we had, we were, we were gaining momentum, we were, we were learning from Jesus, it was a wonderful thing. Um, why is it he here? Well, Judas is the reason. And Judas is the one who told the, you know, the folks where Jesus was going to be and, and plotted all this with the Romans and the, and the Jewish leaders. And it could be that initially there's that thought of he's the one to blame. And, um, but again, that's, this whole thought of God's plan, I'm, I'm sort of like you, Michael. Uh, I, I find that, to me, that is where a theological uh, confusion comes into play. Uh, because it's like, we, we venerate Mary because she's the mother of God. Can you imagine what was what the mother of Judas went through? Uh, because her son died the same weekend. I wonder, I know in, in my life, it is really difficult to see God's plan working out right now. But quite often, if I look backwards, I can see how things were pieced together. And quite often, it looks like those things are the people in my life, the right people at the right time, shifted direction and changed them. And I think God here might be just using who Judas was to, to, to push what had to take place. It was God's plan that Judas, that Jesus be betrayed and that Jesus be crucified. And because of who Judas was, he fit into that plan. He was a true believer. He just believed the wrong things. He, and, and, and an understanding of who he was might help us to see that he wanted to maybe force Jesus' hand to show himself. Uh, Matthew tells us that when Judas figured out what had gone on, what his role was, he hanged him. Uh, so an intentional evil just doesn't seem to be present. And you know what worries me, Graham, is when I think about it. Every time I pray, God, let me do your will. I wonder if that means let me be like Judas. Well, I think that's a, that's a frightening prayer to pray. It really is. Think about it. Uh, one of the other things that pops into my mind is we have several different gospel uh, recollections of, of who, Jesus, uh, who Judas was, how he died. But these accounts are being written long after the event. And as they look back at these events of Jesus, I mean, depending on uh, how far out the gospels were written from the, the account, they're trying to make sense out of what uh, ultimately happened. And so, as John mentioned, you know, assigning blame um, or whether it was indeed theologizing that somehow this had to come about, as Mike said, and therefore must have somehow ultimately been part of God's plan. Now, whether God planned Judas to be that one or Judas just happened to be that one as Jesus was dipping uh, his fingers in the bowl of the Last Supper with the one who would betray him, um, you know, that that's certainly questionable. But I, I think that as we look back over the event uh, of, that, of that week, um, we can begin to say, ooh, I can see how the ultimate um, plan of God was being lived out. It happened to be lived out in Judas, whether Judas was actually the bad guy, um, as Mike turns out, or whether he was just human. You know, you know, Mike, one of the things that you just said raises an issue of knowing what was going to happen, saying what was going to happen, Jesus still shared his precious body and blood at that moment 
with Judas and, and, and says, I think by doing that, it's saying, you're a part of my kingdom. And I wonder if uh, that's one of the faces we're not going to bump into in, in our next journey after this life. And it would be interesting to get the reaction of the other disciples at that point. Well, yeah, what I wonder what what is the difference between betraying Jesus the way Judas did and going and hiding out and not doing anything the way the others did. I wonder if there's a whole big difference in that. Good question, honestly, Kevin. So when we see Judas, when you think of Judas, what do you think? Do you think, does he have an effect on your life? Well, in the, in the sense that, you know, I think I think we all betray our Lord you know, in, in many of various ways, uh, probably daily. Um, and... Uh, And, and as some of you have said, I think even in the midst of that, God uses our lives, uses our lives for His good purposes, and does. Um, but I guess in, at the same time, um, I don't want to slip into some sort of antinomianism, but it really doesn't matter. You know, um, and that um, regardless of Choices I made, and so forth and so on. But you know, um, God is God is going to bring His good purposes out of it. I don't know. I I just like to say this whole issue is just very perplexing. Very perplexing. Uh, anyway, it goes it goes back to I think that might be what you said a little bit. You know, people will talk about things happening, like well, this cancer was God's plan for my life, or this un or this untimely death was God's plan. And I really, I really struggle. I really struggle with things like that. The thing that um, comes to my mind as we try to um, place blame on Judas and say Judas is a much worse person than I am is to go back and say all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Are any righteous? No, not one. Now, I might not be denying Jesus or betraying Jesus or the kind of things that we like to put off on Judas and, and Peter, who we will talk about, but, um, but darn it, I am a sinner, and I sin. It's, it's part of who I am, and therefore, I need redemption. I need a savior. I need someone who will dip his hand in the bowl with mine, even though I am not worthy of that. Do you think, Mike, when John talked about that we want to blame somebody, is that not passing judgment, sort of putting ourselves above that? Oh, exactly. Exactly. And I think it goes back, I think it was uh, Luther, maybe, but um, I can't remember right offhand. It, when people say, oh, if, um, uh, if they had come to the end, if Mary and Joseph had come to the end, you know, I would have, I would have found a place for them. Um, and they said, well, why don't you find a place for the orphans and widows now? You know, and, and live that out in, in your daily life. So, you know, I think there's that sense that um, we want to think in this grandiose picture because um, we are good Jesus followers and we know the end of the story. See, see that's part of that that's not written at the time of which Judas betrayed Jesus. The end of the story has been unfolded yet 
Um, so we do know the end of the story, and the bottom line is I am still sinful and unclean, falling short of the glory of God, and in need of a Savior. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Michael. I think there's the as we read the rest of the story, you know, Judas's assumption of the end of the story is totally different. We, we, when we are able then to hear Jesus interacting with the other disciples post-resurrection, there is this sense that there's a, a sense of closure, right? All of them denied, all of them betrayed, all of them ran away and hid or whatever, you know, those kind of scenarios. But there obviously then is forgiveness and, and restoration of the, of the relationship they had with Jesus. We don't ever see that or know that or have that resolution with Judas. But what if? Is, is Jesus the one who meets Judas, you know, uh, following, following Jesus' death and says, hey, but you have to do what you have to do for me, for, for the sake of the world. Right, this whole plan of redemption is that that's where we leave the sentence a little short as part of God's plan for the redemption of all creation. It would help me in understanding Judas's role here. I guess, and I guess wasn't Judas, if it wasn't Judas, Jesus has been talking about his death for, for months. So if it wasn't Judas, how would that have played out? Another disciple, a different individual, Jesus just walking into the you know, up to the pile and say, here I am, scream me out. <laughs> My issue with that, John, is that it, it almost makes Judas out. He, 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 is, he is the hero of the story, in a certain sense. He, 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 he's the other one that gave him life. And I don't and maybe that's not wrong. I, I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm not meaning, I, I don't mean to take it that far. Yeah. It, his, his, his giving of his life was not for me. It was for him. I mean, that's, that was the way he faced the reality of his situation. But what I'm saying is, is that that leaves us with an unended piece of his story in terms of relationship with Jesus. Right? And we don't, we don't get to see if there's any kind of restoration or any kind of reconciliation of that, of that event. Not of the death, but of the action of the, betray of the betrayal. So we, we, we hear and see the same kind of thing with Peter, but we don't, we, and we see Jesus restoring that, but we don't see how that plays out with Judas. And then when we mix it up with, with our sinfulness, as Michael was talking about, we feel that reconciliation. We have that opportunity. We hear it affirmed from other people in, in our liturgies on Sundays and things like that. It's not an answer to your to your quandary. I think we all face that from time to time, and particularly you know, this this particular week. Yeah. Saint Paul says uh, that now we see through a mirror dimly, backwards and forward. But the day will come and we'll see face to face. Guys, it's a joy to talk with you this morning, and obviously we're not going to settle this, but. Uh, We'll close with prayer and we will continue our journey through Holy Week. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious, merciful Lord, you wrap us in your kingdom. Help us to see our way and help us to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 